made the drastic mistake <laughs> of eating um, navy beans and rice and chicken right before I got on here, and now I'm ready for a nap. I'll be fine. I just let, gotta let all the the processed meat and carbs just kind of siphon its way out. Thanks, Dad. The Louisiana boy, New Orleans boy, came with some beans. All right. Hello, by the way. It's Kendall. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, Palm Skillet Biscuit? Thought I had beans in my teeth. And happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I generally do a thing <laughs> on my channel. I'm so bad at consistency at this point, but it's just because life is like a lime. Ooh, it's tart and tangy. 10 points if you know where that's from. I know some people were like, uh, Kendall, are you slowing down because you like don't like making these videos anymore? Absolutely not. These are the joy of my week. My favorite part of YouTube is the communication after a video goes out, but my least favorite part of YouTube is editing. I actually don't enjoy it, but I'm also too much of a control freak to let someone else do it. It's a whole thing. It's my duality. What can I say? So <laughs> the whole problem I have is, is working my way up to getting my reward, which is the whole like camaraderie, but I have to edit it to do that. Anyway, happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do something on my channel called Bad Movies and a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. Last time we were here, <laughs> last time we were here, I got copy claimed by freaking MGM because I talked about their 26 year old bag movie, Showgirls. I will give you your pennies because obviously you're starving, Oliver Twist. They said, this is a ball of but this is our ball of Took me so long to edit, so thanks for that. Uh, if you want to check that out, that'll be up above or you can check it out in the Bad Movies in a Beat playlist. On a side note as well, after watching that movie, I ended up watching a documentary about Showgirls because, whoa, Showgirls is a mess and it's a mess that's in, in a very hard to comprehend way. Um, so I wanted to like watch this documentary called You Don't Know Me. That's not what this video is about, by the way. You know, get a bunch of people together and talk about how they felt about the movie and like how it impacted them. Did it change my thoughts on the movie proper? No, it's still garbage, but actually more entertaining to watch than the movie. So I highly recommend that. I watched it on Amazon Prime, but you won't really get the conversation being had unless you've seen the movie. So there's that. Anyway, this week though, another ball of shit. Even a better one. Oh my God, actually so many. I understand a lot of people already know what this is, so I am kind of late, but some people don't. And I feel very blessed that I can kind of like bestow this knowledge um, because what edification? I, <laughs> exhortation, comfort. That's what my church used to say. Don't try to freaking copyright claim me. I'm giving you business and this is unsponsored. You better take this business. Hear that MGM? Nobody wanted to watch your shit movie until I made a video about it. Anywho, I get a lot of recommendations on Twitter particularly. Those are the, those are where I see the recommendations more often than not. Generally, nothing really sticks out because I get flooded with them so much. But this one, I randomly happened to go into my DMs and one person sent me a, a link to a trailer of just of remarkable garbage. I've never, <laughs> like I watch a lot of shitty romances because of this series, I understand that, but I hadn't been so like galvanized <laughs> to watch one until I saw this. This video is about two things. One is about the truly astoundingly bad movie that we're talking about today, After Burn, After Shock. That don't even roll off the tongue right. But we're talking about that movie today. But beyond that, I would like to preface, take a little little ode, if you will, platform that I found through it. And that, my friends, is Passion Flix. Oh. <laughs> my shitty movie loving heart has never, has never been so serenaded. Have you ever sat there and said, hey, I think one thing I want in my life, like a lifetime level, terrible, sexy movie, but I want them to do it just as bad, but let them have like an R rating. We'll look no further. We finally found it. It is a platform that I subscribe to through an add-on for Amazon Prime. And I, and I did it as a free trial, but I think I might keep it because it's just so bad. It's so bad, it's $5.99 a month. This is not promo. This uh, I really shouldn't be doing this. Run me a check to just get access to, quote, all of your favorite New York Times best-selling romance novels turned into <laughs> movies. I've never ascended so close to heaven. 
I feel very Icarus right now. It's so rich with content. And because I'm only here talking about one movie, I'm not gonna go on and on and on about all of the ones that I, I watched so many. And so, as much as I would like to sit here and talk at length about every single movie I saw, not that I would really need to, they all like kind of blur into each other. <laughs> so instead I figure I'll just start with the first one I ever saw, which is again, 2017, New York Times best-selling novel turn film. This actually, to be more specific, this movie is not just a uh, adaptation of a singular book. It's actually the combination of two books of the same name, the first one, Afterburn, the second one, Aftershock, by a woman named like Sylvia Day, who's a name I've never heard, but I guess, again, she's another New York Times best-selling author, aren't they all? Not that it's not an achievement. I don't wanna say it's not an achievement, but there's a lot of shit on there. Concepts and, and, and trials and tribulation, the character development of two books into an hour and 30 minutes. Rich. And boy, am I glad I knew that because I ended up having, not having to, but my curiosity got the best of me. I ended up reading, well, audiobook listening to the first book because I just genuinely didn't understand the setup. Whoever made this film really thought I don't need to give you like basic information of like who characters are, why they're important, their significance to the story, because I'm just gonna assume anyone watching this movie has read the book, which is what? <laughs> it's commentary 101, adaptation 101. I'm presenting this movie as if you've never seen it because you haven't. I ended up listening to the first book. It was bad. It's not like they were working with one of the great works of American literature, you know? So <laughs> it's fine. But yes, that's one of the core issues like uh, structurally with the movie. It doesn't expound, it doesn't explain. They kind of just introduce a person, whisper their name and you kind of know they're significant, but we don't know why. They don't really care to expound upon people that in some ways are integral to the story outside of the immediate love story. I think it's because partially they know that we just wanna see the smashing. It's about Gia Rossi, Italian Brooklyn girl. And basically the whole movie is about how she ends up having this passionate reconciliation with an ex of hers from two years ago. And they go on this like frantic love affair. Her ex-lover is named Jackson Rutledge. And and fun, fun, this is fun. He's actually the actor that was in Psycho Stripper that we did last year. Ooh, does he blink in this one? Was that just that movie because he was playing a psycho or does he just not, he just don't? <laughs> well, found out. <laughs> Spoiler, he's just as bad in this, if not worse. He might actually be worse in this than he was in that. Cause again, at least in that one, he was meant to be a psycho. He was meant to be crazy. Something about his face makes me greatly uncomfortable. I, I actually ended up watching this movie with a friend of mine and she was kind of saying all of his face looks like it's supposed to in the sense of like conventional attractiveness, you know, like a white man with a sharp jaw and dark features, mysterious, he looks tall, you know, he has on paper everything that you would think would make him attractive. All of those things together are just very off-putting and I don't know why. It feels like if an alien kind of created the ideal Western man. But yes, everything about this movie, the writing, the acting, the pacing, alien lack of orbital socket movement, demonstrably bad. I love it. Please, <laughs> please go watch it. Watch the trailers first, because if you really want to get off sense, I'm, I need you to watch the whole trailer situation. It's just so good. The movie begins, and I can tell that this is a freshman year editing final if I have ever seen one. What is this font? We meet our main character, a native Brooklyner, Italian-American girl. And that was a horrible accent of all of those things. <laughs> Gia Rossi. She is coming to like an agency to interview to be a restaurant agent, assistant, restaurant. Like the first like few minutes of the movie is very like fast paced rendering of, again, information that I think they expected us to know already because we would have read the book. But again, that's not how you make a movie. We pass all the semantics so that we can get to the hot, steamy sex. Is it me or does it feel like I'm talking a lot about like very sexual movies a lot recently? Peel it back a little bit, cause. 
<laughs> don't want to get redundant. We, we, <laughs> but it's so fun. But literally the first 20 minutes of this movie is incredibly, incredibly confusing. And because of that, the rest of the movie is incredibly confusing as well. So you are constantly seeing like new things, new people, new themes, new concepts, but you never got the last one. What I gathered from the audiobook, because again, certainly didn't get it from the movie, is that she's applying to assist this woman here. Her name is Lei Young, one of the few Asian names in film that was unapologetically Asian. I was watching another thing the other day and they showed like a cop and he was like obviously East Asian and his name was like, John Miller. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, it's okay to have Asian names. Okay. Anyway, Leia's like, hey, why do you want to work with me? Slash, what do you offer to the position? You know, interviews. I've got a degree in uh, restaurant management and like my family owns a restaurant in Little Italy. And, and she says all that. And at the end of it, she's just kind of like, okay, thanks for coming. Goodbye. <laughs> Whatever you're selling, we don't want it. You're not what we're looking for. Goodbye. You know, and before, <laughs> before she leaves out, She's like, hey, I heard there was another restaurant tour guy that you used to date. By the way, I'm filling in this information because they don't explain this. You will be very confused when you watch the movie if you hadn't watched my video or hadn't read the book. I'm just telling you. But she's like, yeah, I know you worked and dated another entrepreneur and I remember how he screwed you over. Well, guess what? A man screwed me over too. So, sisters. Well, I had a man in my life who underestimated me. You proved everybody wrong. I just want to do the same. A man underestimated me as well. It's like, girl, we're both women trying to achieve things in society. You ain't special. We, the, the odds are that we have that in common. But hey, I guess that was convincing enough. You know, enough gusto, enough zeal. Lei Young ends up hiring her. So fast forward two years later, she got the job. She's meeting up with these two twins named Chad and Stacy. Now Chad and Stacy are twins and they are also partners in their restaurant business and they're looking to either kind of branch out, you know, in different directions or together and they're trying to figure out how to go about that. They're talking to different restaurateurs. And I was under the impression that a restaurateur was a person that already owned businesses, but apparently this is like an agency for them, like an agency for people to branch out and create new businesses. They are already kind of working with a man named Ian. And that man is apparently the man that <laughs> over her boss, Lei Young. They're trying to basically steal his business. I love it. Never rise above. When they go low, go even lower, go to hell. So as they're kind of pilfering <laughs> these clients, they're sitting there having lunch and in walks the man, Ian along with our main heartthrob, Jackson Rutledge. When he came in, I said, oh, is he blind? <laughs> oh, wow. There's not a lot of movies about like blind people falling in love. I think that would be really cool. But no, he was just wearing his sunglasses indoors. And I felt really, really bad about that. But it also really reminded me that there's not a lot of movie about blind people dating. People. We have a we have a hole in the market. But yeah, he comes in slow motion and immediately we as the audience are made aware that this, this apparently is the man that had underestimated Gia from her past, you know? Cause we never would have put two and two together that way. Jackson Rutledge is actually the son of a very important, rich political family. Though he is not a politician himself, his father is actually like some senator or something. They have money, they have influence, they have power and prestige. And apparently he had took a trip down to the slums, I guess is what they're kind of insinuating <laughs> when he started dating her. He's a successful venture capitalist, renowned ladies man, and now he's back in Gia's life. So after the encounter with Jackson and him just kind of standing before her, Gia tells Lei, you know, she used to have a relationship of sorts with Jackson. She met him in Vegas when she was in school out there. Essentially an extended five week, one night stand with him. And he probably didn't even remember me back there. It was nothing serious. She does admit, however, that she's not indifferent to him in a way that may hinder her job. Kind of agrees to step back away from any dealings with him explicitly and more focus on one of the twins, the guy twin that kind of uh, seems to really like her, Chad. But before she can even do that, in walks Jackson in the conference room, unannounced, here to talk to Lay about business. And oh my God, this man looks like a serial killer. <laughs> Are they really trying to convince me? 
<laughs> that this is just like, but a somber, stoic, beautiful man, not at all threatening. Just a somber ballad of reunited loves. Where is the, the dun, 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 orchestra? My dude looks like the Night Stalker. <laughs> He's giving me all types of Richard Ramirez vibes. But you put some emotional, cute little copyright free music on top of it and suddenly he's not giving you serial killer tease. And I call poppycock hullabaloo. Ain't no way in hell that I would see this man and be like, I mean, ooh, he doesn't give me like chop my body up and put me in separate freezer bags and eat me throughout the year tease at all. But anyway, she sees him, gets short of breath by the very nature of seeing all of his manly splendor. Alex to act like she doesn't even recognize him. How long are you gonna pretend you don't know me, Gio? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know what emotion he's trying to do. Like, is he supposed to be like this arrogant, cocky bastard, alpha male bull that, you know, all of these movies like to do? One would think that a person who's doing like arrogant SOB would smile. Like, <laughs> they, they often like smirk, they often blink, um, you know, move various parts of their face in sequence with each other at the same time, often because, you know, they're human beings. He can do nothing but move very isolated parts of his face at a time. Like he'll move his eyebrows, but moves nothing else. One point animation, it's like, okay, I'm focusing very much on this mouth part, but I can't like articulate the rest of like human movement. Again, alien, if you will. It feels very like other life form to try to make the perfect man. And it's very like uncanny valley E. Anyway, Jax is there to convince Lei, her boss, uh, to not work with the twins anymore for some reason. Doesn't mean that we can't multitask even though he can't multitask several things on his face at the same time. Also gonna be there and kind of like making Gia feel uncomfortable essentially. Like, hey, you remember that time we used to smash? And what was interesting about this <laughs> is that I've never seen someone fumble the sexy talk bag more. You could tell that whoever wrote this movie has not flirted in a very long time. And that's me. I would probably write something garbage like this. I don't flirt. I'm just a little bit of a butthole and people think I'm being funny. Um, <laughs> men don't love themselves. I've recognized because <laughs> yikes. Anyway, but there's so much that he says that I, I was like bracing myself for like kind of gross men talking, but I ended up getting like a 12 year old. Don't toy with me, Jax. It's beneath you. I want you beneath me. What the hell is this? <laughs> Seriously, what the hell is this? I'm all here revved up. He seems tall, he's terrifying. So I'm like, okay, is he gonna at least give us some suave energy to kind of balance everything out? No. <laughs> he's giving me like severe spelling out boobs on a calculator energy. It's like, sir, you're in your thirties. Get <laughs> Like what is happening here? And I'm sitting here like, is she really gonna throw the cat? For a man who, who spits game and nursery rhymes and saying this for this entire series, better investments. But like I said, Jackson is there to basically convince Lay to stop working with the twins. Why? I don't know. And to be honest with you, they might've explained it, but who cares? This movie is terrible. So I'm gonna say they don't. <laughs> so in the meantime, you have Gia who ends up meeting with one of the twins, one of the clients, the guy named Chad. Gia ends up taking Chad to her family's restaurant called Rossi's where her and her family, her brothers and her mother and father kind of run this family establishment. You get the vibe pretty quickly that Chad is interested in her, but um, she's gonna end up with Jackson because we, of course, saw that coming. But the thing that's really sad about that is in the very little time that they're communicating, already have better chemistry than she will ever have with the brick with legs that she <laughs> ends up with. And it's so sad and unfortunate, but he is a client. So I understand not wanting to mix business and pleasure and what have you. And while they're talking, he essentially says that the reason they're having such disputes and unable to figure out who they want to work with is because she's actually having sex with the other restaurateur guy that screwed over Lay Young, Gia's boss. Again, they don't explain this very well in the movie at all. So as confused as you are, even though I know what I'm, I think I'm getting this right. I was about to say, yeah, I know what I'm talking about. I might not. I really didn't get it until I read the book. Again, y'all really don't know how to make a movie. Anyway, and then once I understood that, I was like, ew, Ian's like 50 something. He's dating Chad's sister, Stacy, who looks at most 27. Um. Yikes. Also, what was Lay doing with him either? Lay looks at most in her 30s, if that, ew. Anyway, while they're talking over business, in walks Jackson with Stacy at 
Rossi's restaurant. So that was rude. If a dude did that to me and it was so like painfully apparent, I, even if I liked you before, I'd be like, ugh, never mind. Here he comes and because this is a movie, he has to give us, you know, possessive, jealous, alpha male. Ugh. And he ends up seeing her in the break room or in the back or whatever. And he's like, are you thinking of having sex with Chad? And you think of having sex with Chad because you want to, or, or are you trying to do it to get a client? Ugh, no, she's considering him because he blinks. He has appropriate usage per minute of his orbital sockets. They work the way they're supposed to. And she, for some reason, realizes that that's something she's been missing. Deadass, he is so terrifying to me. He is staring at her in the most predatory way and not in a sexy way, like, oh, come get me, daddy. It's like very like violent. There's a violence here that's uncomfortable to me. I've never had a movie do this to such an extent extent where you really are using music and just like the progression of the story to kind of gaslight me into thinking this is hot. Let me clarify, romantic movies do this as a genre. <laughs> like that's just what they do a lot of, but I've never, wow, I've never had it work so incompletely. Don't f him. Now let me just say, this could be my Scorpio rising popping out, hello. Also my Aries moon. Even if even if I wasn't even planning on do it, I would do it now. I would I would just give him the double fist clock clock. I would just go off the drooliness, slobberiest, super soaker motor boat whopper wop ten thousand. Just cause I'm petty and not even to tell him about it. I would do it for my own satisfaction. The next day to get under her skin, I guess, he sends her chocolates. And these chocolates are significant because they are the chocolates that they used to use to lick off each other during their sexy times when they used to see each other. Which by the way, is just an awful scene. But beyond it being just a really bad scene, it's also like when I start to notice just how bad the music is in this movie. They played like the same three songs over again and one of them is decent, but there's one that's just like as decent as that one is, as awful as this one is. Say you wanna wanna a major. And they tend to play it during sex scenes, which makes the already bad scene even worse. It's astoundingly bad and loud too, loud as shit. And one of the things about the crappy music that really frustrates me is that it ends up drowning out the most awful part of this movie. But the only reason I knew it even existed is because I saw the trailer. In the trailer, he's like licking chocolate off of her stomach and he's like, mine. Mine. <laughs> Jesus, take the wheel but the music's playing so friggin' loud in the movie that you can't hear it. They knew that one was exceptionally bad. They were like, ooh. And also like the fat ass in me just gets frustrated by the gross misuse of delicious looking food. Those look really good. Those look fancy. So later, uh, Gia ends up recognizing that there's an article that Ian, the rival restaurateur, that's really hard to say, rival restaurateur, was donating money to the Rutledges, so Jackson's families campaign. And that's where they're starting to notice a correlation between Ian and the Rutledges. Lay ends up asking Gia to ask Jackson for more information because she knows they had a pass with each other. In the middle of this conversation, we have Ian, the rival restaurateur, calling Gia and Lay to invite them to a gala of sorts at a Rutledge estate. And it's also for that night. They really said, you ain't got nothing to do. What if I had to shave my ass or something? What if I was just <laughs> taking the whole day to myself? So what do they do? They take his private jet down to the Rutledge estate in DC. And while they're there, Ian just explicitly says that he's trying to poach Gia away from Lay. He kinda alludes to Lay not being exactly who she seems, but guess what? They never do anything with this. They never, they never have her like betray her or anything. It's just, he's like, she's not what she seems and that's it. In the course of this conversation, we find out how the Rutledges, who are politicians, have anything to do with the restaurant industry. And apparently the Rutledges do a lot of things for Ian because they owe him a favor because Ian introduced Parker Rutledge, who is Jackson's father to his new wife after his first wife died. I know it's a lot of names. It's also even more confusing because they don't explain any of this well at all. But before we can really talk more about this conversation, guess who cuts in? Jackson. And we get more just awful flirting from him. It's so sudden 
and awkward and very hypersexual, <laughs> but in a way that's very like clumsy and sophomoric. Clearly I wasn't the dirty little secret I thought I was. Except when you wanted me to be a little rough, a lot hard. My dude has negative game, minus game. He just stares at her really hard and says like, you freaky when you wanna be. <laughs> that was too much emotion. He doesn't even do that. <laughs> <laughs> and it really betrays this whole message of him being like a suave, uh, calculating businessman. They leave the party to speak in private. They, I don't know why this is so funny to me. It's because I'm easily amused, but they spent a weirdly long amount of time uh, showing us them walking to privacy and they didn't cut it at all. Like we would have known they journeyed a little bit without seeing it the whole time. But anyway, and then suddenly as if we didn't see it coming, he starts to give us this raper vibe. And again, they play this cute music in the background as if this isn't creepy and they just assume oh yeah you're supposed to understand that this is just all this sexual tension bubbling to the surface as opposed to this being the progression the natural progression of like a slasher i'm gonna kiss you no you're not try this on me jackson shut up gia yikes uh not as hot as you think that is. <laughs> that wasn't hot. That wasn't a question. That wasn't an inquiry. He said, I'm going to kiss you. It's not called hot. It's actually sexual assault, but okay. I genuinely feel like whoever made the script for this movie and also probably to some extent, the woman that wrote it had never seen two human beings talk. I made the right decision walking away. Doesn't mean I don't regret it. You'll hurt me. I'll worship you. <laughs> you remember how it was, my cock inside you. <laughs> Not with the somber music. There's something about how that like hard C syllable permeates the soft billowing winds. I just- <laughs> It's not enough, Jax. It has to be, Christ. Don't ask me to turn you into one of them. I'm sorry, I, I wanna say more, but there's so much about this scene that really speaks for itself. In the like two years I've been doing this, I, very few times am I left completely speechless, but I, I have nothing to add. This is beautifully, perfectly hilarious on its own, Jesus. But before they can go further, cause Lord knows with this unbridled passion they would. In walks uh, Lay and Chad. Apparently they had been speaking and kind of finalizing deals throughout the party. And she ended up getting him to sign kind of a tentative deal at this party alone and without his sister. Now, even as this is coming out of my mouth, I'm realizing as I'm saying this, I'm sitting here kind of building up this so story with like Chad and, and him as a client and them trying to get him as a client. I, I've come to realize as I'm saying this aloud, it does not matter. We <laughs> We're gonna spend so much of this movie about how they're trying to acquire this client only for us to never really hear much about this client. He doesn't become like a viable third party in like her love story. He doesn't become like really involved after they sign him. That's it. They just kind of said, okay, we needed him to kind of start the story and that's it. We, <laughs> I'm like, what lazy writing? Especially again, because like I was saying, he's so much more like of a dynamic with her. It was such a wasted opportunity. Oh my gosh. But now back home, Gia is just bombarded with the tantalizing memories of Jackson ravishing her body. <laughs> <laughs> she decides to go to Jersey to visit one of her brothers. Um, she gives him a call. He's like balls deep in a random woman. We never figure out why. But the only reason I want to bring this up is how weird this is. Like mid pump. He like picks up a call from his sister talking and it's just weird. Why are you answering the phone? And he's like, no, it's fine. You, sh you can come over. I'm like, this feels very like, but anyway, he goes over. He, you know, the girl that he was with leaves. He's like, do you still love him? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, what? Why? What has happened? What did I miss? I've been watching the whole movie too and I don't see what, is it the thrill of knowing or not knowing rather if he's gonna blink this hour? Is it the anticipation that at some point he might actually fully morph, gather enough AI information to be like indistinguishable from other human beings? So that brother is actually in Jersey running a second Rossi's 
restaurants. And while she's there, she's like helping him out and walks Jackson wearing a Rossi's t-shirt. And apparently that was enough for them to start playing that one terrible song over and over again, because that's how you know they're about to smash. But yeah, she's like, take me back to your hotel or whatever. And they smash against the wall and on the floor while he's wearing jeans. Why do movies make men wear jeans during sex? That's so weird. Don't get me started. Watch my Fifty Shades Darker video. I'm not gonna go into this again. And they're just spent. Oh, I need to get the feeling back in my legs. And it's like, we just saw you. We saw the sex. It wasn't like they panned off that, you know, like they do in like Lifetime movies. Like we saw it. That's taking your breath away. That's taking your movement, your walking. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but after the sex, she's kind of like, oh, I'm happy that I got that out of my system. But like, we can't do this again. Cause I know you're gonna be such a disappointment. You're gonna disappear on me like you did before two years ago. You just up and ghosted me when we had something special or whatever. And, <coughs> He, <laughs> in another quite alien movement, he does this like weird elbow thing where he's like, give me a chance to show you that I am not the man I used to be or something like that. Back at work, apparently Ian has signed some girl named Isabel. Now again, we don't know who Isabel is, but apparently that is like a problem. We don't know why as the audience, but apparently that's an issue. For a moment there, I really did think I was like, is something I'm missing? But apparently she doesn't even show up on screen. Looked up the cast. There's nobody named Isabel as a character. So like, but apparently Isabel talked to Jackson and for some reason that makes Gia mad that Ian has signed her now. And basically she feels like he betrayed her. So, she sees him standing outside of his car, leaning lazily against his presumably expensive car, grabs his neck and makes out with him passionately and then slaps him. I nearly pissed myself. You know, <laughs> it was so funny that you have no laughs left. Like you're just left in just blank befuddlement and just saying dryly, that's hilarious. This entire movie is that for me. It's the whole thing is just like, wow. The slap was overkill. You had me down for the count with a kiss. You letting this man mess with your grown woman bag and all he has to give you is dusty dick and middle school limericks? That didn't mean to rhyme. Flirting with you like he's eight. And you're just like, wow. Dating handsome Squidward, a mannequin, the husk of a human being, and you're letting him mess with your money. And they get back to his house or his apartment or something. She's like, I'm mad at you, but I'm gonna give you angry sex as payback. It's like, that's not payback. That's not a punishment. That horrible song is playing again. And so she's like giving him um, mind control really good at like not getting demonetized for sexual stuff. Get demonetized for everything else. With sexual stuff, I'm getting away with it. <laughs> but she doesn't finish. And I suppose that's supposed to be like her power move. Like this is the punishment, I guess. And I'm like, girl, you still don't have the bag. Like, God. Suck me or f me. This man is a menace. I think you need to cool off a bit first. I think you need to get your gorgeous ass back to bed first. She still doesn't even follow through with that. She doesn't actually use it as a punishment. She's just like, oh, and they end up making up, uh, making out against the window and stuff. Jackson's dad comes to the door. Let me just play the scene. I don't want to describe it. Jackson, <sighs> I know you're here. We need to talk. Give me a minute. And he ends up inviting um, Gia to dinner with him and his his uh, second wife. Uh, well, his new wife. <laughs> like he doesn't have two of them. You know, this isn't Utah. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. So, <laughs> you know, you should come and have dinner with me and my wife. He would like to get to know her more because, quote, Jackson keeps her all to himself because he's trying to protect her. What would he have to protect me from? Why did she leave the elevator before that? Before he could answer? That? Are you are you not curious what he has to protect you from? She ends up finding out that the Rutledges, or particularly Jackson, has been trailing her, monitoring her, uh, 
stalking her surveillance and she's like how long have you been following me y'all been taking pictures of me blah, blah. but not like mad enough because she's stupid she takes it as a compliment hey how long have you been following me you're f***ing rutledge what was it surveillance and invasion of privacy come with the territory well i wasn't f***ing you when those pictures were taken i'm just sitting here trying to process that you're in love with me or <laughs> or or maybe he is actually a serial killer. That could also be an option. I would argue the most viable option, the most likely. Many a serial killer will like surveillance their victims in advance, you know? Giving me very like BTK killer. <laughs> very. There's so much that I've really realized in romance that's so dependent on using tropes that would be genuinely terrifying in real life and turning it into its it's hot. Side note, this is complete. This is going off like notes and everything. I started watching uh, Good Girls again. Perfect example of how it can be done <laughs> in a way in which we're very well aware that he's terrifying, but also introduce this kind of conflict of him being really hot. That's a hot ass man. That's a I highly recommend the show, by the way. I haven't watched the third season, so by the way, I can't recommend it. I can't recommend the third season. Usually that's when everything goes down the toilet. But Gia is less concerned about finding dead bodies and more excited about finding out more about Jackson, like what lies beneath. And instead of really talking to him about that, she says, well, he's following me around. I'm gonna get a reporter to look in on him. She contacts one of her brothers and apparently he used to date a reporter and he still is on relatively good terms with her. So she ends up saying, hey, let's have lunch, me and this reporter chick. She's basically like, only thing that I really ever heard about the Rutledges is that the mother, so Jackson's mother is kind of this enigma. And when she died, she was kind of hidden away from the spotlight and nobody really knew much about her. And it was very mysterious or whatever. And she's like, but yeah, I'll look into it for you. Back to Chad, cause they got to give him a little something. Uh, he goes to Gia after finding out that Gia and Jackson are dating. And he's concerned about that being bad for business. The person he's working with is having sex with his rival because Ian is in cahoots with Jackson and Ian is also their rival as a business. So he's like, this is a conflict of interest and ends up firing her. Okay, so now my Capricorn son mess with my emotions, mess with my state of mind, but you don't mess with my bag. You let him mess with your money, multiples, and you still talking to this dude? She was actually on location at Chad's new restaurant that he was building in Atlanta when she did that. And so she's at her hotel and she's sad because now she doesn't have a job anymore. And here comes Jackson in Atlanta because quote, she wasn't answering her phone. He flew in. This took a flight to a whole ass different state because she didn't answer her phone one day. I can be needy, but not that damn needy. You a serial killer, baby. You know, more choice line delivery. You weren't answering yourself. Uh, newsflash, I'm avoiding you. Newsflash, I'm avoiding you. But he comes to this door in a very like intense way that again, makes no sense with the, with the progression of this story. I'll get on my knees, baby, please. When you got there, you didn't know that she had lost her job. So like, what? I will crawl on my hands and knees. I'll do whatever it takes. That don't get on his knees once. But more importantly, what fight did they have to warrant this? He really came out of nowhere like, baby, please, down on my knees. Forgive me, Lord. Like, I'm just sitting here like, what the hell is going on? He comes in and he starts going on and on about how she can't believe his family. But he's like, two years ago, I went away because I knew what it, this life that I live can turn into for you. I've seen it destroy people. And he's just kind of like walking around saying lines that have nothing to do with each other. I think I keep you safe from the big bad wolf. I am the big bad wolf. I actually did that better than he did. Yo, editing Kendall, put the clip in. You really think I protect you from the big bad wolf? I am the big bad wolf, baby. The lines are so bad, I'm often left speechless in ways that butthole, mouse, and vagina teeth never could. He's like, your life will never be the same if you end up with me. Everything you do will be on tomorrow's news. You could have said something like, I'll do whatever it takes to make our private life worth the public health. This isn't a goddamn romance novel. Or, <laughs> She moves in with him. They have this very like slow motion cinematic sex as if we 
haven't seen them have sex before. Like, this is the first time they're having sex. At least the song is decent this time. I actually kind of like this one. They have another event. We end up meeting some character named Allison who is literally there for this one conversation. We meet her here, right? Kind of allude to the possibility that she's not just a bitch, but she's always been a bitch and that she's had interactions in the past with Gia and she was a bitch during those two. And my question is, who the hell is she? Why are we, <laughs> is she the villain? Cause she's given a lot of like, you know, catty woman tease, but we're getting her an hour and eight minutes into the film and an hour and a half film. So I'm like, who is this? She's Jackson's sister-in-law. So his brother's wife. And I guess they've interacted before. Oh, I need you to know what it's like to be in this family now. We're gonna act like we love each other. We're gonna have dinner. We're gonna spend time together. And even though we both hate each other, we're gonna act like we don't. Cause that's what we are now. We're all in a family of fake performative alliances. Everything about this movie is so like not subtle. This is what the rich people do. You have to be surveillance. This is what the rich people do. You have to be fake. And it's like, or <laughs> you could just show us them being fake and being surveillance. Back at work, Jackson offers to invest in Chad's business so that she can work with him again. Problem solved. Jackson's brother starts coming to her family's restaurant and she's like, I don't like you meddling in my life. Now all the like politician stuff and all them, they're coming over here now. What is going on? And what's hilarious is that he literally said to you that would happen and now suddenly it's a problem. <laughs> so that reporter lady that she talked to briefly, here she comes back and she's like, hey, this is what I found out that apparently the wife was mentally ill and they had her institutionalized. So like, that sounds like a story to me so i'm about to make an article yikes okay and she's like hi huh, you can't do that who said i wouldn't make an article about it i did the research which i mean she's not wrong still in bad taste but anyway but the thing is like i don't know why she's surprised like she's a reporter that's literally her job it's to snoop for information and then talk about it like why would she snoop and not talk about it you took billable hours and word gets back to jackson oh we need to stop the people from running an article man gia's like hey um i'm i'm kind of the reason why there's an article being made about you they argue basically he says she didn't she wasn't crazy she had a problem with alcohol because she couldn't deal with the life of being like a political person and that gia reminds him so much of his mom Sounds like it a pussy. Some Freudian bush. Gia reminds him a lot of his mom. Simple, from a simple town, down to earth girl who wasn't made for this life and that's why he had left her before and he was trying to protect her from this life because his mom was too weak and that's why she became an alcoholic, at least according to him. He basically says this whole relationship was a mistake because of course they have to have a breakup arc. And then she's like, okay, fine. So she leaves. After a quick conversation with her brother, the one that used to date their reporter, he says in passing, like she was a freak in the sheets and she would send me a bunch of photos and extort people by sleeping with them. I don't know if she like had her brother's coat or something, but she ended up getting her nudes and says, if you run the story, I'm gonna put your nudes everywhere. There's a lot of yikes going on right now. Oh, fine, I won't run the story, click. And then like after committing a felony, uh, they just smash in Julius Jubilee. Gia's brother ends up yelling at her for extorting her with nudes or whatever. Uh, but they make up pretty soon after that, but he just feels like Jackson is changing her for the worst because that's how people in his world would have done it. But whatever, they make up. It's whatever and in the final stretch of the movie right you don't like it's been so long but nothing really happened jackson's dad comes to gia says hey you need to stop him he's making a horrible mistake he's planning on leaving the family business essentially of politics and all that which he was never really he was never a politician so why <laughs> he doesn't want to run for office ever i guess his family was trying to convince him to do so he tells his father like i am not going to be a politician and i'm getting married which i suppose was supposed to constitute a proposal. <laughs> All that bullshit I was feeding you about being strong and dealing with it. I said the same things to my mother the last time we spoke. I think they killed her. We never, we never find out what he meant by that. Like, did he mean like figuratively? <laughs> like they drove her to drink or like, 
Like, he never explains that. And he's like, don't worry about it. Let's get married. Because <laughs> there's a wedding to be had, just like Lifetime, just like Hallmark. None of that other stuff matters. We, the goal, the point of this movie is to get married. Uh, they have a little, like, kind of anti-wedding at her parents' restaurant, uh, wearing, like, jeans and a t-shirt. And, and that's the movie. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. Oh my god, I know. Garbage. It was truly so bad. Remarkably terrible. Please watch it. I say this as a person who knows what my people want, and this is some trash. All of Passion Flicks is some trash. This is not sponsored. As much as I'm pushing, I don't even push this hard for my own sponsorship. <laughs> I need y'all to watch this and tweet me. Tweet me afterwards, because I'm sure it'll be a fun time. Okay, that's all for today's video. Please don't mind my hair. I I straightened my hair for the first time in like two or three years. I use, I use like new hair products. I use a bunch of Olaplex stuff and I think it made my hair actually too soft and so it can't like hold any shape. So it won't stay straight, but it won't curl either. And I also bought heated rollers that didn't do shit, and I think it's because of that. Anyway, I digress. If you like this video though, be sure to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram, Twitter, and I pop up on random stuff. I, I'm everywhere. <laughs> all of which are Kenny JD. And I will see you guys next time.